Okay, now that we have a general understanding of the Great Awakening and the evangelism sweeping through the colonies during this time, um, and then have the general understanding of the religious mood of many of the colonists, we're going to today read one of the sermons from that time, from Jonathan Mayhew. Um, in his sermon, he references some Bible verses from Romans chapter 13. So first we're going to go through that. This right here, this notebook assignment is after this video in Schoology and this will be today's assignment is to write these four questions, one for this one and three for that one in your notebook, take a picture and submit it. Okay, so here are the Bible verses referenced in the sermon. It's the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, he who resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of him who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God to execute his wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay all of them their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Okay, and so the question for this selection is, what does this passage teach about political authority and revolutionary activity? Okay, so write that in your notebook and write what you think this passage is saying. Is this passage saying to obey authority? on earth or not okay is it saying that the rulers on earth are the same as obeying god okay so answer that question of just a plain text reading of these bible verses okay you can pause the video if you want to do that or you can come back and answer it after i read the sermon and go through those questions So here's the excerpt from Jonathan Mayhew's sermon from 1750, a discourse concerning unlimited submission and non-resistance to the higher powers. Here we go. Let us now trace the apostles, that is Paul's, reasoning in favor of submission to the higher powers a little more particularly and exactly. For by this it will appear, on one hand, how good and conclusive it is for submission to those rulers who exercise their power in a proper manner, and, on the other hand, how weak and trifling and inconnected it is, if it be supposed to be meant by the apostle to show the obligation and duty of obedience to tyrannical, oppressive rulers in common with others, of a different character. The apostle enters upon his subject thus, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Here he urges the duty of obedience from this topic of argument that civil rulers, as they are supposed to fulfill the pleasure of God, are the ordinance of God. But how is this an argument for obedience to such rulers as do not perform the pleasure of God by doing good, but the pleasure of the devil by doing evil? 
and such as are not therefore God's ministers, but the devil's. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Here the apostle argues that those who resist a reasonable and just authority, which is agreeable to the will of God, do really resist the will of God himself and will therefore be punished by him. But how does this prove that those who resist a lawless, unreasonable power, which is contrary to the will of God, do therein resist the will of the ordinance of God? Is he resisting those who resist God's will the same, the same thing as resisting God? Or shall those who do so receive to themselves damnation, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Here the apostle argues more explicitly than he had before done for revering and submitting to magistracy from this consideration that such as really performed the duty of magistrates would be enemies only to the vile actions of men and would befriend and encourage the good and so be a common blessing to society. But how is this an argument that we must honor and submit to such magistrates as are not enemies to the evil actions of men, but to the good. And such are not a common blessing, but a common curse to society. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doth evil. Here the apostle argues from the nature and end of magistracy that such as did evil, and such only, had reason to be afraid of the higher powers. It being part of their office to punish evildoers no less than to, to defend and encourage such as do well. But if magistrates are unrighteous, if they are respecters of persons, if they are partial in their administration of justice, then those who do well have as much reason to be afraid as those that do evil. There can be no safety for the good, nor any peculiar ground of terror to the unruly and injurious. So that, in this case, the main end of civil government will be frustrated. And what reason is there for submitting to that government, which does by no means answer to the design of government? Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Here the apostle argues the duty of a cheerful and conscientious submission to civil government from the nature and end of magistracy as he had before laid it down. That is, as the design of it was to punish evildoers and to support and encourage such as do well. And as it must, if so exercised, be agreeable to the will of God. But how does what he here says prove the duty of a cheerful and conscientious subjection to those who forfeit the character of rulers, to those who encourage the bad and discourage the good? The argument here used no more proves it to be a sin to resist such rulers than it does to resist the devil, that he may flee from us, for one is truly the minister of God as may the other. Thus, upon a careful review of the apostle's reasoning in this passage, it appears that his arguments to enforce submission are of such a nature as to conclude only in favor of submission to such rulers as he himself describes. That is, such as rule for the good of society, which is the only end of their institution. Common tyrants and public oppressors are not entitled 
to obedience from their subjects by virtue of anything here laid down by the inspired apostle. I now add farther that the apostle's argument is so far from proving it to be the duty of people to obey and to submit to such rulers as act in contradiction to the public good and so to the design of their office that it proves the direct contrary. For, please to observe that if the end of all civil government be the good of society, if this be the thing that is aimed at in constituting civil rulers, and if the motive of government for submission to government be taken from the apparent usefulness of civil authority, it follows that when no such good end can be answered by submission, there remains no argument or motive to enforce it. If instead of this good ends being brought about by submission, a contrary end is brought about, then the ruin and misery of society affected by it, here is a plan and positive reason against submission in all such cases, should they ever happen. And therefore, in such cases, a regard to the public welfare ought to make us withhold from our rulers that obedience and subjection which it would otherwise be our duty to render to them. If it be our duty, for example, to obey our king merely for, his, for this reason, that he rules for the public welfare, which is, only, which is the only argument the apostle makes use of, it follows by a parity of reason that when he turns tyrant, and makes his subjects his prey to devour and to destroy, instead of his charge to defend and cherish, we are bound to throw off our allegiance to him and to resist. And that according to the tenor of the apostle's argument in this passage. Not to discontinue our allegiance in this case would be to join with the sovereign in promoting the slavery and misery of that society, the welfare of which we ourselves, as well as our sovereign, are indispensably obliged to secure and promote as far as in us lies. It is true the apostle puts no case of such tyrannical prince, but by his grounding his argument for submission wholly upon the good of civil society, it is plain he implicitly authorizes, and even requires us to make resistance whenever this shall be necessary to the public safety and happiness. Let me make use of this easy and familiar similitude to illustrate the point at hand. Suppose God requires a family of children to obey their father and not to resist him and enforces his command with this argument that the superintendence and care and authority of a just and kind parent will contribute to the happiness of the whole family so that they ought to obey him for their own sakes more than for his. Suppose this parent at length runs distracted and attempts in his mad fit to cut all his children's throats. Now in this case, it is not the reason before assigned why these children should obey their parent while he continued of a sound mind, namely their common good, a reason equally conclusive for disobeying and resisting him since he has become delirious and attempts their ruin. It makes no alteration in the argument whether this parent, properly speaking, loses his reason or does while he retains his understanding that which is as fatal in its consequences as anything he could do were he really deprived of it. Okay, so yes, that was a little bit rambling. And for the sermon, our questions are, how does Mayhew's interpretation of Romans compare to the straight reading of it? Okay. So how does he pick apart the argument in Romans, in the, in the Bible verses? 
Okay. Number two, why do you think this sermon, which was originally de delivered in 1750, was so influential during the Revolutionary War? Remember, the declaration wasn't signed until 1776. So 26 years later, people are reading and listening to this sermon again. And lastly, number three, who was his audience at the time? Okay, and so of what importance might the time and place of him giving this sermon be in our understanding of the document? Okay, so who was he talking to in picking apart this argument of in Romans? What was the audience? Okay, um, you can see in that last little portion, he compares this to a family and says, Yes, the children should obey their father, but when the father is trying to kill them, then maybe the children shouldn't obey him anymore. Okay, so take that as your clue. When you finish watching this video, the next thing in Schoology is the assignment to write the questions and answers in your notebook and take a picture and submit.